right, good morning, everybody. My name's Amanda, and I'm one of the pastors here at First Broad Street. And uh, Russ mentioned earlier that we are at the end of our sermon series on stewardship. Now, it's not every day that money talks to us like it did in this promotional video, right? If money talks to you, then we probably need to have a meeting together. But money does speak, doesn't it? The way that we use and spend and give our money has a lot to say about what we prioritize in our lives, right? Money does speak in some ways. It may not be an audible voice, but it speaks to that priority in your life. Well, these last few weeks, we've been focusing on stewardship, on managing God's resources for us. And this idea of stewardship is focused on the fact that it all belongs to God. And so if it all belongs to God, what should I do with it? What should the church do with it? And what will God do with it? Two weeks ago, I started the series on what should I do with it? We talked about the importance of four things that we have to recognize as people of faith. The first is that we have to acknowledge, first of all, that it all belongs to God, right? It all belongs to God. The second is that every spending decision is a spiritual decision. Whether you choose to believe that or not, it is a spiritual decision. The third is that the exact amount isn't what's most important, right? We have a goal of 10% laid out in the Bible for us, but going from zero to 10% can seem debilitating. And so what I'm challenging people is to give more than you gave before, to give until you feel it, till you notice it a little bit. And so that is the exact amount isn't what's most important. And finally, stewardship requires action. Unless you decide and, and decide to act on that giving, it won't happen. Stewardship and managing God's resources requires action on our part. Last week, if you were here, you heard Joe speak about the people of Nineveh in ancient Mesopotamia, right? And he did all these numbers with his arms and his fingers, and I can't redo that for you today. But what it came down to at the end of that sermon was that the people of Nineveh mattered in the eyes of God, and they had forgotten that they had value and that they were worth something. And so I hope you walked away at the end of that sermon knowing that if it all belongs to God, what should the church do with it? Well, the church should do what God does with it. God values people. God makes people feel worthy of love. Knowing that every human being is worthy of God's love in this world is such an important message for us to share with people around us. Well, today we conclude our series with a commitment Um, At the end of this sermon, you'll have a chance to actually make a commitment to pledge your gift for 2016 to God. And that is a step of faith. Not all of us know that we're going to definitely have a job for all of 2016 or that we're going to definitely have a a source of income for 2016. We don't know what the world's going to throw our way. But what we do is we take that step of faith based on what God is calling us to do. And so to make a promise based on our income of 2016... I hope that you've been spending some time in prayer uh, leading up to this. But as we begin, I want to read for you all one of my favorite passages from Jeremiah. Hear this word. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we know that it all belongs to you. Every single thing that we own, every penny that we have in our bank account, it all belongs to you. And as followers of you, help us to know what to do with that. Lord, I pray that this morning you would speak through me and in spite of me a word that would encourage and compel us all to live more like you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Jeremiah 29 speaks about the future. Well, speaking of the future, did anybody go back to the future on Wednesday? I have a a picture of the paper. So if you all remember, back in the late 80s, mid-80s is when Back to the Future, the first one, came out. But this is one from Back to the Future 2, where they actually go into the year 2015 And this is the newspaper from October 21st of 2015. 
And so as a spoof on this, the actual USA Today did a front cover that was identical to this one um, and published it this past Wednesday. But, you know, 2015, when they went to it, so this is um, Marty McFly and Doc Brown, if you've seen the movie. They fly back to the future, so fly to 2015, in this souped-up DeLorean, right? And it flies through the air, and they travel to 2015. And boy, were they surprised by what they saw, right? They saw all kinds of things they never imagined, from hoverboards to shoes that tied themselves, right, that just snapped on there, flying cars and actual clothes that dried themselves while you were wearing them. Do you all remember that part of the movie? So, and there are some things that actually have come true, like they saw video conferencing for the first time. Well, that's something that many of us use to talk to our our grandkids or our kids via Skype, right, or other things. So we video conference people. And we also use flat screen TVs. If you remember in the mid 80s, um, back when the when Back to the Future came out, my TV looked something like this one. I asked Daddy what, what model of TV we had, and it was something like this, and it was encased, and you had to go up and turn the dial. Um, it, was, it was wonderful because it was TV, and TV was in our home, and it was in color. And so we didn't know to anticipate these beautiful flat-screen TVs, right? In the early 90s, I would have watched Back to the Future on one of these. This is actually home movies of my sister and I that I transferred from those old reel-to-reel cameras, you know, the video cameras, to this because that was the future back then. I wanted to keep this for safekeeping, but I would have watched Back to the Future on something like that. Now we watch intro videos this morning on giant flat-screen TVs that have great definition. And I watch movies on demand with my Amazon Fire Stick, anytime I want to, right? I don't have to get the VCR out, although I do still have one to watch things like this. But I don't have to do that. I can actually just watch it on my Amazon Fire Stick. And this right here, many of you have these with you, this iPhone right here, has just about as much power and is faster than computers that used to take up an entire room. So this supercomputer, you see that the speed of the iPhone is three times, almost three times what it was of a giant computer that used to take up the whole room. And then finally, another blast from the past. Does anybody know what this is? Ooh, wow. This is how you did it with the left thumb on the red button. And man, I dominated Frogger and Pac-Man. I did that on my, on my uh, Atari and I loved it. Didn't we love it, Daddy? It was awesome. But today, instead of that, we have this nice wireless Xbox One remote, which, uh, fun fact, Justin actually registered for this Xbox One on our wedding registry, and he got it. (laughs) I think they felt bad because it, you know, it costs less than the cookware that I registered for, right? But this right here, I can can dominate, uh, you know, the Sling TV or Netflix from this wireless remote or through voice command. Anybody done that yet? On a, It's amazing. It actually recognizes your voice and it will um, go to where you want it to go. So things have certainly changed. You know, so I was thinking about all the hype from the future becoming reality on October 21st. I realized that there are a lot of things that our church does that Man, they would really shock our godfathers and godmothers of the church, right? Things that we do that would just blow their minds. Now, a few years ago, and hopefully some of you still do this, but 30 years ago in the mid-80s, you wouldn't think about coming to church without your Bible, right? There were fancy covers designed for it. You always had it with you. You brought it to church proudly. I had a little bag with the handles on it. Everything I needed was in that little bag, But now, if I want to look up scripture, and I don't have this Bible, I just go to my Bible app. Anybody do that? Yes. And you can get devotions on this. Everything is accessible to this. So 30 years ago, I would have never thought that I could put my Bible in my pocket, along with all my contacts and every bit of information I have on email, and all of that would be able to go with me wherever I went. Now, that is, you know, a double-edged sword, right? Because things go with me everywhere I go. You know, 30 years ago, it would have um, 
been something that you did, and we still do this in traditional, but every single week, without fail, you would have turned in your Methodist hymnal, maybe to number 400, to Come Thou Fount, and you would have sung it with the organ. And today we see, in contemporary at least, that we have words on the screens that help people worship more freely. You know, if you're a brand new Christian, and you come to church you've never been to before, and they say, take out your hymnal, if you've never been in church ever, can you imagine thumbing through this book trying to look for a song to sing? And so these words on the screens actually make it easy, more easily accessible to people who are new believers. And so we have that um, on our side. And then finally, finally, 30 years ago, you would have never come to church casually dressed, ever, right? Ever. You would have wrestled on the pantyhose and you would have, you know, put the tie up close to your neck. And now your preacher stands before you in a denim dress. My grandma would probably roll over in her grave if she knew that I was up here in front of you. But I wonder sometimes, what is our church going to look like in the year 2045? That's 30 years from now. Hopefully by that time I'll have adult children who can help take care of me, right? Uh, Maybe I'll have some grandkids, but I wonder... Will this church that we have before us surpass our wildest dreams? Will will there be some things that we dream that never become realized? Or will there be things that just blow our mind? Will it resemble our church from today? And so I wonder, what is God going to do with First Broad Street? And so this week, as we conclude our sermon series, we're talking about if it all belongs to God, what will God do with it? What will God do with it? And I think that's really important. We've learned what we should do with it. We've learned what the church should do with it, right? Now we need to talk about what God's going to do with it. If we could come up with a dream for this church, I wonder what it would be. Mike Slaughter, the author of the book that we did last Christmas that compelled us to give $200,000 on our Christmas Eve miracle offering, he writes in his book, God Size Dream, that if you have a dream before you and it seems reachable, then it's not big enough. If you think that you can achieve the dream that's before you, then that is not a God-sized dream for your life. That's an Amanda-sized dream. And so when we think about what God's dream is for our church here, it's amazing. It would, it, it's unfathomable. Almost, you know, you can't capture it in words. Lucas and I get together every week, and we talk about life, and we talk about worship, and just how God's working in our lives. In the last few weeks, there's been a theme to what we've been talking about. We've been talking about our desire for First Broad Street to have a vision for the future, to have something to work towards. You know, we know that we help people follow Jesus by loving God, growing together, and reaching out. But what does that mean in 30 years? What does that mean even in five years? Um, Lucas described it perfectly the other day. He said that church should be like a gas station, a place where people come to fill up and then they're sent out to the world to share the truth of Jesus. So we want, to, we want you here to create lasting life change that goes and follows you on a daily basis. But sometimes we like to treat church like a long-term parking lot, Right? We come here, we do what we do with church and Sunday school, but then we go out, and until next week, we may not think about church again, or we may not read our Bible, we may not read scripture, we may not even pray until the next time that we're in the church doors. Some of us think that being a Christian is that, that that is, that's all that you need from me is the bare minimum. Come to church, come to Sunday school. Well, yes, we do want you to come to church. We do want you to come to Sunday school. But we believe that life change means that we're not growing our church in numbers. We're growing disciples who are making disciples who make disciples, right? That's how churches grow. It's not about counting a number in a seat every Sunday morning. But to me, the way that I measure what God's doing in us is life change. What happens outside these doors in your personal lives? I think, you know, of a Christian offering a helping hand to someone, an elderly person who's trying to load their groceries into their car. That is living out your faith on a daily basis. A Christian is someone who takes one of these bright orange flood buckets and goes out and buys the stuff that they need. And this is a true story. There was one of our church members last week who was at the dollar store, and they were buying stuff for the the bucket, and somebody came up to them and said, what are you doing with all this stuff? This is kind of odd things that you've put together. And she said, oh, I'm building a flood bucket to send to South Carolina for uh, disaster relief. 
And the woman that she saw took $3 cash out of her wallet and said, this is all the cash that I've got, but I want to help. That is a powerful witness, right? That's life change to me. And that person, that person who gave that $3 experienced life change in that moment. A Christian is one whose life is so countercultural that people start to wonder, what is with this person? <laughs> what are they doing? Why are they making these decisions based on all these wonderful moral values and these teachings of Jesus? Why won't they gossip with me at work? Um, why is it important for you to keep your Wednesday nights and your Sunday mornings free? Why is it important for you not to schedule something when your small group meets on a Monday or Tuesday night? Because you, as a follower of Jesus, are living out your faith daily. You have lasting life change. So when we look at contemporary worship elements, and, and Lucas and I talk about that, and the flow of the service and the music and the message, we want to constantly ask ourselves, how do the things that we do here at First Broad Street create life change? It's up on the screen. How do the things we do at First Broad Street create life change? And so our scripture this morning from Jeremiah is one of my favorites, and it gives me such assurance and hope because I know that it says right here that if I, I, will seek, if I seek God, I will find God when I seek God with my whole heart, right? So I want us to read Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13 again. I want us to do that together because I think it's important um, to speak these words of truth into our church and into our, our community um, because my hope and my prayer for us is that we do have a future with hope, and I believe that if we focus on God, we will. So let's read this together. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Notice what it doesn't say. It does not say, if you come and call on me, I will make your church double in membership. It doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't say that God will bless us with infinite resources and money so that we can spend money on whatever we want, whenever we want, at any given time, right? What does it say? It says that God has a plan for us, a will for our lives, and that we're called according to his will to fulfill those purposes, right? And so what does it look like for First Broad Street to prosper? What is the future that God has for us here and what do we have to look forward to and to hope for about our future? Now, in the last series, um, the Bible does the Bible really say that? We talked about everything happens for a reason and how that phrase can be harmful to our faith because we believe that as people who have free will, the decisions that we make affect the things that happen. And so with that as the basis, it's easy to say that as a church, if we don't make the right decisions based on God's will, then our church may not be filled with hope. We may not have a future filled with hope if we aren't constantly seeking, discerning, and following God's will for us as a church. Now, the church will exist. The church has existed from the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and before that, there were the people of Israel. And so the, the church isn't going to die in our lifetime, right? We hear all these statistics about that. The church isn't going to die because there have been lots of things that have happened. There have been crusades, but then there's also been church plants. There have been tons of things that have happened that have threatened the church by martyrs, but then you also have mega churches. And so when the Lord says that the people of God will, have, will prosper and have a future with hope, it means that uh, in spite of how we act, if we are acting towards God's will, that we will be blessed. This is the promise that God offers us but we can mess it up, right? As I think about what it means to go back to the future, I wonder what my experience would be if I could see the future of First Broad Street. You know, I'm not really sure. I wish that as your pastor I could tell you what I see in the future, that I could say it in such a compelling way that you're committed to this church for the rest of your life. But I can't because I believe that our vision today may change tomorrow with God's direction and God's will. But what I can say is that you have leadership here through your pastors, through the church leadership council that is brought on by our nominating committee. 
you have the kind of leadership here that really wants to follow God's will for our church and for each of our lives. We're committed to doing that. And we as your pastors are committed to listening for God's voice. I can't tell you what our church will look like in 30 years. I can't tell you two years from now what our budget will be or what we'll spend our money on necessarily because times are changing. Expenses are going up and giving is going down. I can't tell you those things, but what I can tell you is that I believe God has a future filled with hope for us here, and I want to be a part of something like that. Don't you? Amen? Whatever happens in our future, it may look familiar, or it may look like a hoverboard, (laughs) something that you never dreamed possible. It may be something that we can dream up right now, or it might just blow our minds. But regardless of how it looks, we have to do whatever it takes to live into that future. Hebrews 11.1 says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And I hope that our church will not just survive in the future. I have a hope that we will thrive in all that we do. And I cannot see the future, but I am certain that God is going to use us to transform lives, to transform this community, to transform this world to create true and lasting life change in the hearts of our people. And so, if you're here to experience life change, I want you to know that you're in the right place. If you're here because you don't like to be comfortable every single week and walk out unchallenged, then you're in the right place because we're going to challenge you. We're going to make you feel uncomfortable because I believe that's how we grow, right? That's how our life changes. If you want to be a part of a church that changes this community and this world and helps usher in the kingdom of God, then you're in the right place. That is who we want to be. If you want to be a part of a movement that began in the early church and spread across the sea in spite of adversity, you are in the right place because that is our heritage. That is where we came from. And I believe that we're going to continue to share the word of Jesus, so that it can change lives with, in people's hearts and, and their daily lives. Now, I'm not sure if Joe mentioned to you last week, but um, this week we have this chance to give, and our budget for 2016 is a little bit less than $2.8 million. That is a huge number to me. And if it all belongs to God, which we believe that it does, then God has and owns all that $2.8 million, right? That $2.8 million just happens to be in my pocketbook or your wallet or your mason jar or your nightstand drawer if you're like my husband. That money is out there. God's just waiting for us to commit it to him, to give it to him, to be good stewards of what we have. It's there. God just wants us to turn it back over to him in an act of faith. And so this morning we have the opportunity to pledge, to commit our resources for 2016 to God so that First Broad Street can help create lasting life change in people, so that we can make disciples for the transformation of the world, so that we can make disciples who make disciples who make disciples, right? And that's how the world begins to change. I've encouraged you to pray about this this pledge as a family and as individuals, and I hope that you've come today ready to to put your pledge card in the basket. I've asked you to give back what what already belongs to God, right? And so Justin and I have talked about it and prayed about it, and we've decided to increase our monthly pledge for 2016. Um, I've mentioned before that we're not at 10% yet. We, We aren't there yet, but we're getting there, right? Year by year, month by month, we're growing closer to what God's um, desire is for us, which is to give 10% of our income. In a moment, we're going to have the offering of our pledge cards. This is different than the morning offering, and I'll say this again, um, but as I'm going to invite the band and specifically Chrissy and Lucas to share about our Loving God ministry. So you may remember we've had people share, a staff person and a lay person share about um, what God is doing in their lives and how stewardship affects what they do in those different areas. If you don't have a pledge card today and you would like one, Uh, While they're speaking, uh, the ushers are going to be walking the aisles, and if you need one, just reach out and grab one. Maybe you've already sent yours in. Some people have already mailed theirs in. We know we've gotten a lot of those in there. Know that that gift is so appreciated and is going to be used for building up the future of the kingdom of God. 
So they're going to share, and if you need a pledge card, uh, let us know. And then in a moment, when the music starts, we'll, um, I'll come back up and we'll say a prayer and take our pledge cards.